Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Can you hear me over there? Can you see me? Um, unfortunately, we have to do a bit of business. Um, this is uh, the confluence of three meetings, the Bayes 250 day, which has been, <clears throat> I think, so far uh, a, a unique, uh, entertaining, uh, intellectually engaging day. Um, the band will play again later in the evening, so the day will transmogrify into the Bayes 250 night in Bayesian tradition. But it's also uh, the third day of the workshop, the research workshop of the OBEYS section of ISBA and the section on economics, finance, and business, the EFAB section of ISBA. And we have to do a little bit of business. And the business we're going to do is, is make some awards. And so I'd like to invite Ed George, the current chair of the OBEYS section of ISBA, to come up and do the obey stuff, and then we'll hear from EFAB. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everybody. Uh, the theme, Bayesians have more fun, continues. Uh, this, was, this was a theme forever, absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and you, for you youngsters, and welcome to the club, but yeah, it was Bayesians have more fun all the time, and they looked at us and wondered. They didn't know. Anyway, uh, it's my honor. Tonight I'm going to present the awards for the posters uh, for the OBEYS section, and I'm very happy to do that tonight. Um, before I announce the, the uh, award winners for the poster prizes, let me just say that every year the quality gets better and better and better, and it makes it harder and harder and harder. I mean, given these posters, I would never have had a chance years ago. <laughs> so they're just, I, uh, thank you for laughing, Jim. But, but no, but it's so remarkable. So everybody's poster was, was very hard, and this was very difficult for us. We're doing our best to sort it out, and absolute congratulations to the winner, but, but everybody, congratulations, they were terrific. I'm going to announce the poster prize winners for the Obey section, and, and as I announced your name, I'd like you to come up, and Susie Bayari, my dearest colleague, will, will give you your prize. Please hold your applause until the end, okay? Otherwise, uh, we'll take way too long. So to begin with, Honest, honorable mention for best methodological poster at OBEYS 2013 is given to Zoe Van Havre. Zoe. No, oh yeah, no applause. Who, who, who applauded? I hope I didn't hear that. Okay. Zoe, thank you. And, uh, great. I thank you for listening to me, everybody. Okay. Okay. No applause. Honorable mention for best applied poster at Obey's 2013 is given to Andrew Womack. Ah. Uh, uh. Boy, this is great. This feels like when I teach my classes. No control whatsoever. Honorable mention for best theoretical poster at OBEYS 2013 is awarded to Geotishka Data. Uh, great, thank you, thank you everybody for listening. Honorable mention for best methodological poster at OBEYS 2013 is given to Yingbo Li. And honorable mention for best theoretical poster at OBEYS 2013 is given to John Bernard Salomon. Susie? Uh, 
Okay. And now, for the winners. The Jeffrey's Excellence Prize for Best Methodological Poster at Obey's 2013 is awarded to Xiaoxing Wang. Oh, oops. The Jeffrey's Excellence Prize for Best Theoretical Poster at Obey's 213 is awarded to Tri Lee. Ugh. And finally, the Jeffrey's Excellence Prize for Best Applied Poster at Obey's 2013 is awarded to Andrew Brown. Congratulations to all the winners. Now you can applaud. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, thank you all, and I'm going to turn it over. Oh, we have a photo. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Mike West. Lights, camera action. Thank you. Can, can I ask the Obey's executives to settle down, please? <laughs> so now we move to the section on economics, finance, and business. I happen to be the, the founding chair of EFAB. Um, we have... I need Ed up here, don't I? Uh, we have several sponsors of the meeting. They've been... They've been uh, Accorded various accolades throughout the meeting. I've, I've got a, a subset of them up here. Uh, these are the sponsors of the EFAB Awards for the first workshop of EFAB. We have an award from BEST. For those of you that don't know, that stands for Bayesian Enhanced Strategic Trading. Um, and they have been uh, immensely supportive of basic education and research activities in Bayesian statistics and econometrics and finance for a number of years. We have an award for a student uh, poster from IBM, IBM Watson Research Center, um, who are going great guns on big data, big complex modeling, uh, big computation uh, using Bayesian methods. We have uh, Google sponsorship, <clears throat> which is supporting participation of a number of junior participants, and I'll uh, announce those in a second. And we have uh, awards from Oxford University Press that we have designated the Oxford University Press EFAB Awards. We do theory, we do methods, we do applications, we don't discriminate. Let me skip to the, I, 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 have, no, I have no role in this. Uh, we have an award committee, I'm going to introduce the award committee uh, and the judges and, and, and they'll make the awards. But I do want to, we're gonna pull out the Google Scholars. Uh, Google has been very supportive of Bayesian statistics for many, many years, and rightly so, because Bayesian statistics has been immensely important to Google for many years, and has uh, been generous in supporting the participation of a number of junior participants. Let me ask uh, you to stand, if you are named, Brenda Betancourt. Is Brenda here? Don't, well, there's seven of them. Let's, let's hold the applause until they're all standing. <laughs> right? Angela Bito. No comment. Andrea Eros. Where's Andrea? Uh, Xiaoye Ma, University of Minnesota. Xiaoye is not here. Uh, Alexandra Posikani from Vienna, too. 
I apologize for the pronunciation. Matthew Simpson, Ohio State, and Zhang Yong Yin, Ohio State. So we have seven Google Scholars. Uh, so IFAB, this is the first research workshop. It's the first serious meeting of the section of ISPA. And uh, we have a, what I hope will be a standing awards committee. The chair of the awards committee is the treasurer of the section. So let me invite Fei Liu, the treasurer of IFAB, up to the stage. Fei? Fei? Where is Fei? Oh, she's in. Sorry. So Fei, Fei is, um, in fact, a, a, a Duke alum. Uh, she spent uh, a number of years at Watson Research Center in, in, uh, in New York. It's currently at Queens, Univers Queens College of the uh, University of New York. And she's the uh, chair of the award committee. I'd also like to invite Sid Chib, who is the chair-elect of the EFEB section. I've got three weeks and then I'm done, so I, I want to retire early. So I'll ask uh, Faye and Sid to present the awards. Thank you. So I've updated my prior course, and I'm not going to ask you to hold the applause. So please feel free to clap wildly uh, as the awards are announced. Um, I would like to begin by um, by uh, thanking Mike for his leadership in set setting up this section, and I think it deserves his, his work and, and leadership deserve uh, a round of applause. Okay, the first prize, and these are extremely deserving awardees, uh, the first prize is the IBM EFAB Junior Research Award, and this is presented to Zoe Yi Zhao. <laughs> Zoe. And actually, if you will see, don't, don't be in a hurry to cash this, because it's, uh, it's an IOU. It's an, it says on the back, an ISPA um, IOU. Okay. So it's actually a fake for the moment. Um, so we, we, discussed, we, we got to know uh, the names only this morning, so the checks have not been written out uh, to the awardees. The second, the second prize is, oh, you cannot hear me? Um, how about now? That better? The second prize is the best EFAB award for junior researchers, and this is presented to Zoshi Nakajima. Zoshi Nakajima, if you would please come up. And Zoshi's work was on Bayesian latent threshold dynamic models. Congratulations. Okay, continuing on, the third prize is awarded to Hao Wang, and this is the Oxford University Press EFAB Junior Research Award, Hao Wang. And finally, the second Oxford University Press EFAB Junior Research Award goes to Jared Murray. Jared here. Thank you. 
and a big round of applause for everybody, for all the winners. Thank you. Okay, well, don't give up yet. Now we're in for a bit of a treat. Um, I am delighted to introduce Sharon Birch McGrain. Sharon is a um, well known author of a wonderfully successful book. The Theory That Wouldn't Die, I have it with me here, and uh, it's now available in paperback for only $16, a bargain that you cannot refuse. Um, so apart from this successful book, Sharon has uh, uh, notably written other books, including a book on Nobel Prizes for Women in Science, and a uh, book on chemists called Prometheans in the Lab, and uh, um, this book, as, uh, as we noted, has been remarkably successful, and uh, uh, the result has been that Sharon now speaks at a variety of uh, meetings and labs and universities around the world, and we are particularly delighted to have her here, and I just wanted to mention the opening quote, which is actually attributable to John Maynard Keynes, and uh, I think it's particularly relevant for us because he said, when the facts change, I change my opinion. What do you do, sir? Uh, and so with that, Sharon will talk to us about how Bayesians became chic and fashionable. I always start these talks with uh, some truth in advertising that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a statistician, I come from newspapers and writing about science for uh, the general public. I, I want to talk tonight, though, uh, strictly anecdotally, uh, strictly non-technically, as if we were sitting around a dinner table together, about this recent and revolutionary explosion of interest in Bayes and how you Bayesians have become fashionable politically correct heroes in certain corners of American popular culture. And into this, I will tell you a bit about my own personal odyssey with Bayes, and I'll answer the question half the people in this audience have already asked me. But first, I want to say thank you to many of the people in this room who helped me with the theory that wouldn't die. You're too many to thank personally tonight, uh, and I want to also express, uh, take the time to express my gratitude to two people who are not here tonight. Uh, one, of course, is Dennis Lindley, and the other is Rob Cass. Uh, Dennis Lindley agreed in 2007 to answer questions, my questions, by mail, by postal mail, letters. And over the next uh, five years, he wrote 30 wonderful letters. They were like getting presents when they came through the, the door or the mail slot in, in my door. Because he provided a first-hand view of that middle of the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, uh, for Bayes. And I'm greatly in Dennis Lindley's debt. Now, Rob Cass is here for much happier reasons. He had other fish to fry. But he took the first whack at the whole manuscript for me. Uh, Jim Berger and Alan Dale uh, went through it later for Yale. Um, but Rob Cass took it on first. And he later explained to me why. He had said that he had spent much of his career trying to understand and promote Bayesian analysis. And I happily, I think, fell into that one of those slots. And it was Cass who turned a project that I was really not satisfied with into something that, that was a lot of fun. And it was Cass, incidentally, who convinced me, as, as Lindley had tried and failed to do, that I really had to give Jeffries more, more attention. Now, the question that I'm asked first and foremost is how on earth did I start writing this book? <laughs> um, how did I get the idea? As far as I know, as, as far as the family can tell from my emails, I started in 2000, 
to. Um, my, I, I was trying to figure out a, a new book topic, and I had come up with what I thought was a whole series of magnificent topics, which my wonderful agent shot down one by one uh, for very good reasons. And she finally said, you know, you should be writing about mathematics because the publishers, uh, the, practically no one writes about mathematics. And she said, there's a fabulous offer for an, an a fabulous advance to write about Bo the Bourbaki. Well, I thought that would be terminally boring. So I turned to my husband, and I have to explain why. He's, he's a physics professor. Uh, but at the time, he was uh, the editor of the main review journal for physics. So he had this rather broad view of the field. And I was stirring dinner away one night at the stove, and he was standing over here, and I asked him for ideas, and there was this long silence. And then he said, Bayes, I'm seeing more of it now. And I kept stirring. Well, I have to tell you, I, 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 this is so embarrassing. I'm sorry. I, but I feel as though I have to be truthful with you all because I asked you to be truthful with me for the book. Uh, so I had spent a good part of my childhood on the Chesapeake Bay. So I said, Bays, how do you spell it? <laughs> He spelled it, and then he's a man of few words. He said, look it up. <laughs> so I did, and I found it reference after reference on the internet to Bayes, and there were only two things they ever said about it. Time after time, Bayes is controversial, which for a person who is writing for the general public, you need a really good storyline to pull people through material they don't really want to know anything about. And the other was that it was started by an 18th century clergyman named Thomas Bayes. And they had his uh, religious affiliation all over the field. Uh, just anything you could almost imagine, uh, they had him down out. So I thought that sounded interesting too. And then of course, uh, when I started reading about Rip Bayes and, and researching it, I, I fell in love with it. So the next question I, I get asked is, is what did I find in Bayes that kept me going, that, that really interested me? And my answer here depends on who asks me the question. If it's a totally non-science uh, audience, I tell them, uh, we're going to see if I can work this, about the Bayesian spam filters that Microsoft applied for in 1998, uh, was approved in uh, the year 2000. And I think, I, whoops, sorry. Go down on the second column to number 50. In the patent, it says naive Bayesian classifier, a limited Bayesian classifier, a Bayesian network classifier, and a decision tree, which as we know uh, from Steve Feinberg today was of course a, a very Bayesian from the Harvard Business School. Recently though, I've switched. I don't talk about the spam. Oh, I, I should say, the reason why the spam filter is so important is that it was the first public recognition of Bayes. People like me were starting work every morning plowing through Viagra ads and pornography and so on before you could start work. And all of a sudden, that stopped. And the media was filled with stories about Bayes. They didn't last very long, but there was a great brief spurt about Bayes. That was 1998. Okay. Recently, though, I have switched what I tell non-science audiences, and I have gone to the Air France 447 flight and the search for it. Now, Air France, uh, if, if you will recall, the jet uh, flight 447, it took off in the spring of 2009 from Rio de Janeiro bound for France. It meets a very high intensity electrical storm. It disappears into the South Atlantic without a trace, but with 228 people aboard. The, the French government launches immediately what becomes the world's largest and most high tech naval search ever conducted. Uh, it lasted for two fruitless years. 
I spent an afternoon in Paris at Le Bourget Airport with uh, Olivier Ferrante, the French engineer who led the search for this French version of the Civil Aviation Agents Authority. And this picture and the next one uh, he gave me to show people. These are the planes, two black boxes, okay? They're not black, they're red and white. But this is the picture of the black boxes as they are eventually found on the sea floor, 12,000 feet under the surface of the sea. Okay. They're the size of shoe boxes. And Olivia Ferrante, when he started, overlaid uh, on the map of the South Atlantic a map of Switzerland because he said it was lost in a mountainous area the size and topography of Switzerland, but 12,000 feet down. Now, during these two fruitless years of searching by some of the world's leading oceanographers, uh, the French government hires some of the people who were in the theory that wouldn't die, who develop a Bayesian search theory, uh, first for um, finding a lost hydrogen bomb that the US Air, Air Force had lost over Spain in the 1960s, uh, then to hunt down Soviet submarines in the Mediterranean, and then to make US Coast Guard uh, rescues. And using bays, uh, this group calculates the most probable site for the plane's wreckage, where it is found after an undersea search of one week. A two-year fruitless search is ended by bays in one week. Okay. And for me, one of the most revolutionary things about this is that the French government credits bays in writing for the success. <laughs> so you see, in either case, I'm telling non-scientists about the power of bays to do these amazing things. Truth is, however, that I came to Bayes from another route. It was through a great interest in 18th century French history. What historians have called this age of dizzying curiosity, age of ideas, of critical thinking. And the attitude that's embodied in what some say Laplace said on his deathbed, that what we know is insignificant but what we do not know is immense. And I found this whole milieu, what we heard about this morning with the David Hume controversy, uh, it, I like that. <laughs> and that kept me going. So I started out writing about uh, the theory that wouldn't die by calling a statistician who came highly recommended to me as someone who might accept quick questions, stupid questions from a beginner. I sent him my letter, probably a previous book, uh, phoned him, told him who I was. He started screaming. Bayes was fraudulent, dangerous, stupid. He got louder and louder and louder. I, by the end of it, I was holding the phone out like this. He had the lung power of an opera singer. Fortunately, he finally took a breath and I could say, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> Now, the point of this oh, is <laughs> his name is ever lost. <laughs> the point of this totally non-statistical, totally anecdotal story uh, is that I, I, for one thing, I think some of you have probably gone through something like this uh, yourselves, but I cannot believe that any of us would get that reaction today. So profound has been the change in attitude about Bayes. Now the 20th century, is, of course, is where things Bayesian really start hopping. And I often tell the exciting and tragic story about Alan Turing uh, and Jack Good and the British government's decision to censor everything showing that statistics and mathematics, decoding computers, Turing and so on, had helped win the war. To an outsider like me, it seems that that decision uh, was remarkably short-sighted uh, and may have prevented Britain from becoming the leader of the 20th century computer revolution. 
It certainly prevented mathematicians and statisticians from becoming war heroes. In which case, a, a modern term that I really don't like, geek, would have been very different. It would have had very heroic connotations. But thanks to Turin's uh, recent centennial, I want to visit instead some of the ideas and people that you might not be so aware of. Now, I did not realize at the time when I chose the people I want to talk about that you were so um, divided amongst yourselves between business and finance, on the other hand, and the rest of them, rest of you on the other side. And I do apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> but I want to start well with the actuaries. Okay? Because during the First World War in 1918, uh, state legislatures across the country at the, at the behest of industry insisted that each state start overnight workers' compensation insurance. And the actuary started, actually, in the course of an afternoon, not an evening, without any data about sickness, injuries, or death rates in the United States. And they did it by using a stripped-down version of Bayes. Actually, it was Laplace, not Bayes. But by the 1950s, the only organized revolt against the frequentists came not from the military or from the universities, but from these actuaries. And the charge is led by a, oops, no, there, a Bible-quoting uh, actuary named Arthur Bailey. Uh, in 1947, Arthur Bailey comes to realize with his horror uh, that the hard-shelled underwriters, as he called them, had been using this semi-empirical sledgehammer, Bayesian uh, techniques that had been developed in 1918 for workers' comp. Now, Bailey had been properly educated at the University of Michigan, so he realized that Bayes was taboo. And he spends the next year in what he calls intense struggle, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, to realize um, that all of the fancy actuarial Bayesian proceedings of the casualty insurance business were mathematically unsound. Well, at the end of the year, he's decided that to his consternation, sledgehammering works better than frequentism. And he, he tells the actuaries in a, in a banquet talk uh, that the actuaries were recognizing the facts of life. He writes and talks about this extensively, what the actuaries had been insisting on, that they wanted to keep their prior data. They wanted to keep last year's premium. And they would update it with the latest uh, data about injuries and accidents and death and so on to produce the new premium for the next year. And they would not let go of that prior. Uh, so he reads, writes about it and be, uh, extensively and speaks and so on. And he becomes the vice president in a casualty insurance company in Chicago, where many of you may know Al Madansky. Uh, is now an emeritus professor in the business school at Chicago. And Al Madansky uh, gets a summer job working his way through his PhD in statistics at Chicago. And Madansky told me about how the uh, first few weeks on the job, uh, Arthur Bailey came over to his desk. He said he sat down and started chatting. I thought, fine, here's one of the vice presidents. He's trying to meet the troops. And we started talking, and Madansky said, I don't know what has happened, but he mentioned something and said, I used Laplace's version of, and Madansky said, it just popped out of my mouth, of Bayes' theorem. He finished Bailey's sentence. Well, Bailey is enchanted. Uh, he, he's, He's not a man, his, his colleagues really don't understand that the, the level of abstraction that he's dealing with. And he has Medansky's desk brought into his office and Medansky becomes his assistant part-time during the winter but full-time during the summers. And 
Medansky is torn between the insurance, going into insurance or going into academia. Uh, Medansky, by the way, had learned about uh, Bayes and Laplace uh, from Jimmy Savage's class at the University of Chicago in probability. Um, one day, Bailey has a massive heart attack at work and dies. And Medansky is, 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 is in shock. And he goes out into the parking lot and sits in his car and thinks about what, what this means, Bailey's death means for him. And he decides that his ties to the insurance industry were Arthur Bailey. Arthur Bailey is, is, is a very nice character. If, if you read about him, I, th I think you'll like him as much as Medansky did. And that he would go into academia. So Al Medansky takes a postdoc at Rand. And there he wrestles in this very 1950s uh, st statistical problem of how do you deal with something that has never happened. There had never been an accidental hydrogen bomb ex explosion. So the frequentists had told the US Air Force guys who came around asking about it that you couldn't predict the probability of its ever happening because it hadn't happened in the past. And if you all will remember the Dr. Strangelove movie with Peter Sellers, it's a satire on General Curtis LeMay's Strategic Air Command program. Uh, and you can imagine this Al Medansky, this postdoc, young, this young guy, taking on the most powerful military figure in the United States at the time. And he uses Bayes to warn that expanding LeMay's Strategic Air Command, as he wanted to do at the time, could produce each year at least 19 accidents involving unarmed hydrogen bombs. And the Kennedy administration eventually adds safeguards uh, to the program and, and limits it. And the Medansky study was so classified for 50 years that he didn't even know uh, what effect it had until it was finally released in the last few years. Eric. I am finished with pictures. Eric has to turn them off because this is going to be very unusual for you all. I know you, like, you have pictures and you have power things and everything, but I don't. <laughs> so all of this was happening during a period in the 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, when a statistician described this, uh, this, this controversy that the Bayesians and the frequentists were embroiled with was described to me as a massive food fight. The controversy becomes so vitriolic and so personal uh, that when Savage took his nine-year-old son to a garden party at Stanford in the mid-60s, uh, a statistician comes up to them and tells not Jimmy Savage, the grown-up, but the nine-year-old little boy that his father is a deeply deluded man. And as the Savage family observed, the fact that a small child would be considered a legitimate target in this war speaks to the intensity of the battle. There was a particularly poignant case during this period of the Canadian mathematician named Keith Hastings, who published in 1970 what should have been or could have been a breakthrough paper uh, with now what's now called the Hastings Metropolis algorithm. And Hastings drops out of research, goes to teach in British Columbia, and he doesn't realize the importance of his paper until he's retired, been retired for 20 years. And when I talked to him, he told me with, with some anguish in his voice that his work was ignored, he said, because a lot of statisticians were not oriented toward computing. Statisticians took these theoretical courses, cranked out theoretical papers, and some of them wanted an exact answer, not estimates. Now, Dennis Lindley had been using computers, he told me, since the 1960s. But of course, he doesn't catch on either. And in one of his letters, he wrote, quote, I consider it a major mistake of my professional life not to have appreciated the need for computing rather than mathematical analysis. 
his academic descendants, of course, Adrian Smith, whom we heard this morning, and Smith student uh, David Spiegelhalter did realize it. And as Lindley wrote me, a good graduate student like Adrian is a joy. Now, Smith and Ellen Gelfand uh, put all the theoretical pieces together uh, in this theoretical paper in 18, uh, 1989. Excuse me, I have you a century off. <laughs> and they wrote this breakthrough watershed dynamite synthesis about MCMC that used the word Bayes only five times in 12 pages, 12 printed pages. I asked Alan why. He said, quote, there was always some concern about using the B word, a natural defensiveness on the part of Bayesians in terms of rocking the boat. We were always an oppressed minority trying to get some recognition, and even if we thought we were doing things the right way, we were only a small component of the statistical community, and we didn't have much outreach into the scientific community. Now, of course, that paper was not ignored, and Bayesians described it to me as an epiphany for them. Uh, and it set off this frenzy of research because, as, as we heard this morning, Bayesians could finally, after 250 years, really, um, with, with works, uh, the free bug software from David Spiegelhalter with powerful workstations that were coming in at a reasonable price and so on, they could finally uh, calculate realistic problems. Despite that frenzy, it's only been in the last few years that trendy Americans have become aware that Bayes is something they should really know about. John Allen Polos instantly turned Bayes into a fashion item when he wrote in the New York Times book review that if you're not thinking like a Bayesian, perhaps you should be. My publisher was thrilled. He said, this'll sell lots of books. <laughs> and the, the supply of books went out uh, overnight. <laughs> and, and, and there was no book, more books to sell for, for an, uh, another month. I got my own tiny little whiff of this change in the public perception of Bayes. Uh, when I spoke to about 400 young men and one handful of young women at what was called a Singularity Conference, it was funded by the libertarian billionaire Peter Thiel. And these young men came up to me and said, uh, we all had big labels that said speaker and my name on it and so on. And these young young men came up to me and they said, I love Bayes. And I, I couldn't imagine what to say to these people. When I gave my talk and then I left, I, I went uh, walking up the sidewalk. It was in, in New York, and uh, up on 92nd Street, uh, walking on the sidewalk back to the hotel. And I heard this clip-clop galloping behind me of footsteps. And I turned around, and there was a group of these young men following me. And they raced up and said, thank you for telling us about Bayes. I, I couldn't imagine it. Again, I told my publisher, I said, what do you think is happening? He said, I don't know. Please explain it if you find out. I think what they were expecting was that Bayes would turn them into billionaires like Peter Thiel. But, but I'm not sure, I was just so surprised. Then another step in this percep public perception change, much loftier than this, and it came from the White House. Alan Kruger of Princeton. Uh, became uh, president of Obama, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And he began a, a, an interview, a short interview with the New York Times uh, with an utterly gratuitous plug for Bayes. He told the interviewer, I recently finished reading McGrain's book. Bayes' rule is a statistical theory that has a long and interesting history. It's important for decision making. How tightly should you hold on to your view? And how much should you update your view based on the new information that's coming in? We, he said, and remember he's talking about President Obama and the White House. He said, we intuitively use Bayes' rule every day. 
So suddenly, in this most dogmatic era that we're living through, where many of our leaders are proud that they're making decisions based on things they've been told as children, Bayes becomes political shorthand for database decision making. But the most extraordinary example occurred this summer in Montreal at the joint meeting where I watched Nate Silver. Now, Silver was moving from political polling uh, back to sports statistics on ESPN, for I'm sure a lot, with a lot of money in his budget. I want to tell you he was like a rock star surrounded by fans, a Bayesian rock star. They, they call him the king of quants. So in this remarkable revolution, Bayesian statistics that was once the province of two 18th century clergymen and this small embattled group of believers during the Cold War has swept right into the White House and onto cable TV sports. Yeah. In closing, we, we have to ask the question that was asked this morning. What is a Bayesian? And I'd like to close with giving you two definitions of a good Bayesian from Dennis Lidley. 11th of March, 2009. A Bayesian does not claim to get it right, only to be right more often than the other guy. 10 September 2007. A good Bayesian is always ready to change his view on the receipt of relevant information. It is those of fixed convictions that are dangerous. Thank you. I don't know if you want me to take questions or, or not. I should have asked Alan. Um, I, sure. Are there any questions for Sharon? She would be willing to ask otherwise. But remember, they have to be non technical <laughs> <laughs> Say it again, David. There's no, no one here, no one here. I live on, in Seattle on one side of Lake Washington, and he was screaming all the way across Lake Washington at me. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, let's thank Sharon one more time, please. Thank you so much, much appreciated. Well, we're going to have a little bit of music at this point and enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>